This is the Only One Shot Golf Podcast. I'm Jim Gallagher, Jr. We've taken a couple weeks off, and we're excited to get back. We've got a couple good guests coming up uh, in these next couple podcasts. We appreciate you all listening. Uh, uh, but I can't wait for you all to hear from this week's guest. It's Ellen Port. She's won seven. That's right, seven USGA women's uh, titles. Joanne Carner won eight, so that's in the company she's with. Four times a U.S. Mid-Am champion, I think three different decades, Uh she was 25 years when and, and on up when she won. She actually won at age 50 in her last one, which is amazing, uh, because it's 25 years and older, uh, the players that play in the mid-am. Then she's won three U.S. Senior Women's Ams, uh, played on two Curtis Cup teams. In 94, they won. In 96, unfortunately, they lost. She's also captain the winning Curtis Cup team in 2014 in her hometown uh, of St. Louis. It's an amazing story. She's one of the all-time best in women's amateur golf, and I can't wait for everybody to get to know Ellen uh, Port just a little bit better. Well, I promised you Ellen Port, and I have Ellen Port. Ellen, thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Jim. Well, we got a lot to cover, and you're a busy lady. I'm not as busy as some people because I'm off these few weeks, but uh, born in Kansas <laughs> City or North Kansas City, uh, uh, Missouri. You played almost every sport growing up. Uh, basketball and tennis were your loves. Tell us a little bit about your childhood and some of the sports you played. Well, you know, the highlight, I've got to mention our Kansas City Chiefs. I knew you, know, you the, would. The sport I loved to play was I was quarterback in my front yard, and then I'd throw the ball, and then I'd be the receiver and catch it for the touchdown. So that's who you're talking to, the, the Tom boy. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> who loved every sport and uh, finally saw the light. I didn't think golf was a sport. My dad was the golfer, and he'd go play in the mornings, and I couldn't believe he was getting up Saturday morning to go play golf. and then I realized it was not just about golf. It was about the people he was playing with, mm-hmm. you know. But and then he'd come home and watch golf. I thought, this is so boring. <laughs> <laughs> what is he talking about? That was back in, you know, when I was a little kid. So, uh, you know, my dad was the, uh, a golfer, and uh, and I and he did and he did all the other sports too. But I loved loved anything with the ball, and anything that, uh, and so that's kind of. And then of course I found golf, and it's. So many athletes come to know that it's just the greatest game ever played. I will stand on that one. It is. You played basketball and tennis. Basketball, kind of that first love. I believe, if I'm reading this right, I did my research properly, you played tennis in college. Uh, well, what, what I that? walked on, yeah, that only lasted a semester. I was kind of a big fish in a little town at North Town. And I've always kind of been, I like to do different things. And um, I just, it wasn't a good fit for me with the, with it, it, just playing the college sports. So I, I gravitated, of course, to the intramurals. That was more fun playing oh, yeah. Kappa Kappa Gamma football. That's my claim to fame. And, and, uh, but it is kind of funny, Jim, that, uh, I was in a sorority and a couple of my classmates were on the golf team and I was kind of oblivious to it. And then I got out of college and had some success in golf and my college sorority sisters like what were you thinking what, what do you mean you and they were burned out of golf yeah and then i was just getting started so um you know it's just funny how life you look back and as you know as you're getting our age you look back and see how one decision leads to one thing and you know i got to do some opportunities in college um you know i worked at a christian sports camp that i loved and i got to go skiing with my family and you know when you play college sports you don't get to do some of the other things and so I'm a big you know I was still just on that era where you could do it all you know now it's it's specialization and so I was very fortunate to find golf at 25 and have the success that I that I have yeah what's it's good it's you mentioned that specializing and we see it in every sport and 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 you played every sport growing up. I think it's healthy for kids to play all the sports until maybe they get to high school and they can choose a couple of them. You know, obviously your opinion is you think other sports do help golf or, or not to specialize. It's better to have a little variety. Well, everybody's different, yeah. you know, and it is a different world. The competition, oh, my goodness. You know, uh, I just got into golf before the big boom, before all the young people. You know, I would actually worked down with – had an opportunity to meet Hank – Haney and work with Hank down mm-hmm. in the ranch and and I would see all these young girls and all these young players coming and so I you know was fortunate <clears throat> you know I always say I'm my claim to fame is being the last 25 year old that'll ever make a Curtis Cup team you know <laughs> at 25 starting late because there's so many mm-hmm. good the boom I just got in on, on before that um, you know I was still of that era when at the at the big you know the westerns and the trans 
that it was they didn't have junior many junior tournaments for kids so it was everybody thrown into these these women's events you know the young the old the seniors and it's, it was really neat and we were all competitive mm-hmm. you know and so it's been kind of fun as you look back and see your own journey and you know where you fit into that so but the spe- back to your specialization you know it's it's just you got to do what you got to do, and now it's so competitive. But some some girls, I I saw this young player who's playing volleyball and soccer, and then she, her dad, and then she's like, well, I think I want to play golf in college. Hmm. Well, I had to be very honest with her and say, no, man, you are so talented. But the college coaches already have their they're looking at freshmen in college. Mm-hmm. You can't all of a sudden as a junior now say, I want to play D one. You know, you know, uh, co- golf because there's too many good players now. And so I said, you have to make a decision. Do you want to keep doing all three of your sports and maybe play um, at a, a program that's not quite as competitive, not Division One? So you have to kind of make your decisions and what you want. And, and of course, parents have their input, too. So it is, it is interesting navigating the waters today with the sports. Well, in college golf's a job. It's a full time job, uh, and it wasn't like that for me. And you mentioned some of your sorority sisters, and they were burned out by it. And kids get burned out by it. You can see it. Their junior senior years are going like, "Well, I'm not going to turn pro," and I call it senioritis. And they get to the point like, "Man, I have put all these hours into it," and they get a little bit tired because they don't get to have a normal life and get to enjoy college. I think it's so good for uh, young ladies to be able to go. And my daughters did it. You know, Mary Lyndon played at Mississippi State. Kathleen and LSU, they joined sorority so they could have a normal life on top of the athlete's life in college because it's, it, and I'm not trying to say that they're being pampered, but it's just, it's a tough deal to do that. A lot tougher than when I was in college. And so you, you see a lot of kids, uh, like you said, the ones that are freshman year, sophomore year, these coaches know who they want. Rarely do you see a kid come in their junior year, start playing and, and get to an SEC school or, or, a, or a Big Ten school or the big uh, Power Five schools. That doesn't happen that often. But you mentioned coming into golf late. Who kind of got you started? Obviously, your dad. But uh, Well, yeah, you know, I, he introduced me, so I, I laugh and I really – but I don't consider myself, like, starting till I have my own set of golf clubs and playing a tournament. You know, I played once a summer a, right. on occasion with him. But, um, you know, my husband actually played golf. We played our, – one of our first dates was going to a driving range. I brought my dad's clubs. I was a school teacher. I had my summers off. Dad had an extra set of clubs, so I threw it in the back club, back of my car. And I had a couple influences. One of my sorority sisters in college's brother lived here in town. And uh, he said, well, come take a lesson. Come over and meet this guy, this club at our, as pro at Westboro Country Club in St. Louis. So Phil Hewitt – was an old time pro and yeah, I went over and had a lesson with him and he said, Oh my gosh, you know, you could be really good, you know, and that's all I needed to hear, mm-hmm. you know? And then Andy played, we played golf, uh, you know, I, I set as a date, my husband, and then that, so that was kind of our go-to, you know? And uh, so between Andy enjoying it and then me being an athlete hearing, you know, you could be good. <laughs> so the challenge was thrown down and then I joined a little uh, summer public league here in St. Louis. And uh, kind of got saw what it was all about, and I just kind of got hooked, you know, because it just does that to you sometimes. And I was one of those victims, I guess I'll call it. <laughs> what, 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 it what, there was a moment when you're saying, like, hey, I'm pretty good at this. Do you remember that moment? Well, yes, and I remember the other moment. Was, well, <laughs> I, I don't know. I didn't have a reference. Um, I remember a, a, then I went down to another range and would hit balls close to my um, house, and I saw – I looked at, I was fine, you know, with the ladies in the ladies league. You know, I had no idea what I was doing. I'd blow it out of bounds. I didn't even know the rules. It was pretty funny. And they <laughs> recognized my talent. And so I kind of started saying, okay. And so then I saw this girl down at the range, uh, and she had a really a swing like I had never seen. And she was a player from University of Kentucky. And she was working with the pro at the driving range, who I then became very good friends with and who kind of took me under his wing um and got me really started he was the first one that even said curtis cup and i was like what's the curtis cup and terry terry hauser was his name and he's like my surrogate for father and a coach and a really good friend and so i saw cindy miller swing this gal from university of kentucky and i said oh my gosh now she knows how to play you know and Mm -hmm. so i kind of just all along my path you know you got to kind of see what's out there and uh and 
and I was awful. I, my progression was was interesting. I just had that great progression where every year I got a little better, and you know I missed the cut in the state amateur, then I made it the next year and won a match, and you know all those little things. I went to a big tournament, I didn't make the cut. The next year I made the cut, lost the first match. The next year I went back, I won a couple matches. You know, the next year I was, you know, in the quarterfinals. You know that type of thing. I just had a really kind of fast track, um, and so. Yeah, it's just a battle within, you know, you want to, you judge yourself against your competition. You know, I remember playing Carol Simple Thompson, okay? Mm-hmm. So, um, and I think I got beat six and five. But, you know what I said? We sat down and had lunch, and after I got done, I said, well, you know, I can get that good. She, I mean, she's really good, but here I got drum six and five. But I'm still kind of saying, okay, she's one of the best ever. I said, I'm going to work towards that. I can get to where she is, you know? So you it, it's you just kind of do that, you know, as an athlete. I think it's a great uh, – your story is so cool because you picked it up so much later. You see all these kids have been playing since they're eight and nine years old. It proves you don't – you know, you had that competitive spirit. I, I love that fact that you got better each and every year, and I think that was big for you is you, hey, I can do that. And you had – you used other people. Like, you didn't take that as, oh, my gosh, I'm not good enough. She beat me six and five. You took it as, hey, I can maybe compete with, with her. I mean, you won the Metro Am 16 times. The Trans, you mentioned, 1994. You were so good at match play, and we'll get into your USGA record. Uh, but what made you so good at match play uh, and your mindset in that? Because it is you against the other person, and it's a completely different mindset than metal play. Yeah, I think, and, and I'm kind of asking myself, why am I so bad at match play now? Because I used to be good at it. I need to get back whatever. I was. I think I was just a little more oblivious. You know, it's, uh-huh. it's ignorance is bliss. You know, I was so young that all I did was work on my, I had certain things. I had really good instruction coming up, and that was kind of weird how that even happened. But I just was so in the moment, and I didn't even know what that meant until I found out when I wasn't in the moment. I'm like, oh. Uh, and I think I was just so young and so eager, and um, I just would focus on the shot and, and didn't, and pretty much I was just young and naive, and that worked to my advantage in some cases. Um, I also, you know, and I do love that you can, um, you know, I think when you love match play, there is a little bit in your competitor. There is a little bit of a you're playing the golf course, but it's you also know you're playing the other person, and mm-hmm. you're able to kind of strike this balance of kind of like, okay, you know, I'm I'm going to win this, you know, whatever it takes, you know. And it is the people always say, oh, just play the golf course, the golf course, but you really are trying to beat that person. You got to yeah. play better than that person by one stroke, and so there's this weird kind of rivalry competitiveness that you create in your mind and then you know then you just have to get a little lucky every once in a while and you know with just supposed meant to be and I had some of those rounds where you know I probably won some matches I shouldn't have and I look back and go how in the world did I ever win seven of these or however many matches that are that that is and it's, it's just Sometimes you just got to be fortunate. You know, it needs to just be your time. It does. But how did you deal with the pressure and, and, and expectations? Because I think in a lot of my listeners are junior golfers, college players, and even amateurs. I mean, how did you deal with pressure and those expectations, you know, after you were winning all these events and your own personal expectations? Yeah, that's always – that's still a battle because I'm still playing, you mm-hmm. know. And uh, it, it – um, I think it's hard when you've had some success and then you don't – uh, meet your own standards. You beat yourself up. I think everybody go now. And at different personalities, I'm pretty intense. You know, I I'm probably overly intense, and it works for you sometimes and against you. So it has worked against me sometimes. I have put too much pressure on myself. And I remember one summer I actually said, you know, I'm gonna I removed myself from a couple tournaments because I felt like I had such a bad attitude. I was losing patience with myself. And I just wasn't playing in the right spirit of the game. And so for me, it's always, and I do this every day. I'm like, okay, how, what did I do that I shouldn't have done you know, today? Yeah. How can I make amends for either a bad decision or an unkind word or a, just a screw up, you know, whatever. I, kind of that's, I think, one of the reasons why I feel like I'm still getting better in golf is because I always evaluate my performance. Okay. And so I think I don't have the answer to that very well, and I haven't done it very well at times. Um, and at times, uh, I think we all do that. We get, we have to get things back in perspective. And it's like, uh, I think it ebbs and flows. 
and it's a constant battle. No, it is. I mean, you see it on the PGA Tour, the LPGA top players all of a sudden they become like head cases with one bad tournament and they I think a lot of it's the pressure of that personal expectation let alone now with all the media and all the attention people get from other people going like well Tony think of Tony Fee now uh winning one event when are you going to win your next one when are you going to win this he doesn't win enough he's too nice a guy that gets to you uh, and you have your own personal expectations and now he's gone on he's kind of opened the floodgates as we hoped he would uh, but I think they all battle, even the top players. Uh, and I think we go through it. It's a constant battle, like you said, of dealing with the pressure and expectations. Uh, I don't. The, the elite player does, and that's a question I always ask my my listeners. It's and it's a, sometimes a tough one. But what separates that elite athlete, you in, or elite golfer, from maybe the rest? You've played yeah. against them. You are one of them. I mean, what maybe separates? There's some things that separate them. You talked about intensity. That's probably one thing. But what separates that elite player from the rest? Okay, I'm going to come back to that question because I had one more thing I wanted okay, to add ahead. to the previous one, if that's okay. Yeah, oh, sure. Um, I think one of the reasons why I did so well in some of these tournaments is I was working as a school teacher. Okay. And so I wasn't getting to prepare and focus that much on golf. And so I, once I got to the tournament, I was like, okay, let's figure out where the bottom of the swing is. Let's do whatever. I didn't play golf swing, and I didn't feel ready. So it kept me kind of like always on the edge of – even if I hit a bad shot, I'm going to come back. I've got to figure out a way to get the ball in the hole. So it worked for me, not eating, breathing, and sleeping golf. And so that was one of the reasons why I think I did so well, because I didn't. I tend to hyper-focus anyway, and it kept me from doing that because I was a mom, I was teaching, and then, oh, yeah, I get to go to this tournament in a week, and I'm going to just figure out how to do it. You know, so that's my little side note. Well, there, no, you said that, and that's that's true about even a golf shot. Patrick Harrington, and I've mentioned on a couple other podcasts, he mentioned the first tee, and he knew when he was nervous before the shot uh, and, and anxious a little bit, but he got over the ball, and then he uber focused, and he forgot about the nerves. He uber focused. The reverse of that, uh, you know, when he was kind of relaxed and in that mindset to get over the ball, and he goes, oh, he panicked. So you fight that constant battle, and what you were mentioning is maybe personal expectations. You had lower expectations yes. going in there. Yes. It took the pressure off. I think that's a great answer to the question of why you were yeah. so good at match play and why you were such, you know, such a great player. But I think you know, back to the elite, I think those players do that too. I think it's their drive and their, their ability to want to be the best, uh, to work harder than the next one. I think that's part of it. If I was the answer, I know there's always a different answer why the elite player is elite. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. And th- and there are a lot of players who work really, really, really hard and mm-hmm. never get that breakthrough. Sure. So why that is, there's a fine, fine, fine line, you know. And so, you know, I don't I don't think there's a big formula. I know there's so many books about it, but I think you're elite when you are honest with yourself. You you of course do all the right things that everybody else is doing in preparation. I mean, I mean, there's. And you look at, say, what could I do that I haven't done? And you evaluate yourself and you address those issues and find, like, golf is this one big problem solving. And so find the person or whatever it is that can help you if you're not focusing. You know, you have all the mental options. If you're out of shape mm-hmm. or you've got an issue, find out what that is. Like, my endurance isn't very good, so I'm going to focus on getting out and walking more, you know. And right. you have to, to, to be honest with yourself. What am I not doing that I could do? And I'm kind of the one that I like to know that I've done everything, and then I'm like, okay, I'm ready. But that still doesn't mean you're going to win. And that's no. why I have to say, that's why I have to say, forget all that when the T goes up and figure out how to compete and scrap it around like I did when I didn't know what I was doing, you know, and mm-hmm. didn't have all this stuff. So, you know, I think that's kind of it's different why pe- why one person breaks through and makes that putt and the other one doesn't, you know. I think it's true right. with golf instructors. Uh, Sometimes they just – and you see them and you can judge who's the good one, who's the bad one. But sometimes you need to be told what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Uh, the same thing with being honest with yourself. I think it goes in that. And I see a lot of instructors, uh, you know, they, they're getting paid big dollars to help these guys on, 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 or ladies on the tours. And they, you got to tell them what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. Oh, I yeah. Think. And you coached. You know, that's, isn't that one of the toughest things to do? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. You know, I remember speaking of teachers, I have the funniest story when I was working with Hank Haney and then uh, he walked out and I was working on my short game 
And I, I was a hard, hard worker. I mean, I'd take golf balls to bed with me so I could get up and <laughs> be the first one out on the range. And he'd point out when he was coaching SMU and say, see that lady over there? She's taking those golf balls in with her, you know, because his kids weren't working as hard as he wanted. But he, he came out of the short game area, and he looked, out at, looked at me, and he said, Ellen, you know, you have – I said, you remind me of Michael Jordan or something like that. And I thought it was going to be because he had seen Michael or worked with Michael. And I thought, oh, my gosh, there's going to be this great compliment. And he, he did the big goose egg, the zero. He said, you have this much natural talent when it comes to the short game. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> and I but, – but back to your point, I needed to hear that. Mm-hmm. And then when I won my first USGA event – in Essex Country Club in 1995, I had to hit off of a hard pan shot. And I was playing against someone you know, Brenda Corey yep. King. She's oh, a yeah. wonderful woman, person, golfer. And I pulled off this amazing shot. But it was because I was going to defy that. I had to get better yeah. at my short game. And I love that. You know, and, and fast forward to I was I consider myself being in a slump with my game the last few years. And I went to – Steve Johnson, and I don't know if you know Steve, who was he was Hank's mm-hmm. assistant. He's mm-hmm. a great. He and he he just had to get on me about my lack of attention and focus on my rehearsal of my golf swing. Hmm. I was hitting behind the ball. I, mean, I was hitting a lot of shot, and I had to get me back to just doing a rehearsal where the bottom of my swing was always in front of the ball. And he just kind of knew that. He, you know, he knew what I needed to focus on. I just had lack of focus on very simple basics. I wasn't taking responsibility. And he got on me about that, mm-hmm. you know, and, and stayed on me about that. And so, like, okay. So those, I really appreciate that, those people that have been in my life, you know, that tell me what you said, you know, what I don't really want to hear but what I need to hear. Yeah, and you, you mentioned that, like, for me, laying up. I was the worst person to lay up. I just, like sloppy and and just whatever i could lay it up in the lake because i wasn't paying attention you know it's like (laughs) what are you doing so my thought process when i was really paying attention and and i've mentioned it on the air is i kind of felt like it was a par three shot and focus in like you're hitting an iron shot into a par three and kind of pick a target to hit at instead of like all right it's 150 yard or 180 yard layup and just you know nonchalant lay it down there so i kind of had to focus for me to make it feel like a par three. When I did that, my layup was a lot better. But I, I think that's right. I think we kind of – sometimes we get lazy with stuff and, and somebody says one little thing and it clicks. It's always amazing. Golfers are one shot from being the greatest and one shot from being the worst. Uh, Isn't that the truth? It's so well, – I, I love that. I'm going to use your little trick on the layup for focus. I think that's great. I, no, I, I really um, – I, I, I think it's just really uh, – I mean, because I – I went for a lot of things, and to see my wife would tell you that I, and anger was part of my problem too. But threw away a lot of cash by just not being totally focused all the time. Uh, it's just getting let, getting sloppy. Uh, not mm-hmm. that you and I. I worked with Doctor Coop, the sports psychologist, and I said, Doc, I can't. I play so fast, I can't concentrate for over four hours. He goes, You don't have to. You spend about 35 minutes concentrating you know, on the shots you're hitting. That's all you're doing. In between, go look at the fish in the lake. Go do something else. Go talk to somebody. Uh, and that really helped me uh, because I do. I did play so fast. And if there was a shot clock in golf, I'd win every week. You know, I would just <laughs> – I'd, I'd win every single week because I just could I, – I just – my dad was the club pro. He always said, stay away from the members. You're not a member. And, and that was always in the back of my mind. Even I'm 61 years old and I still think of that. I turn around, see if I'm holding somebody up. It's so crazy. Uh, but I grew up with that, and I think that's part of the reason I, I played so fast. But, and I think everybody struggles with that focus, and you just have to, to, to realize it's not four hours and 15 minutes or whatever it takes to play, or it's that few, that few what, 30 seconds or 20 seconds to hit the shots. It's the only time you have to really be focused. But you mentioned the USGA titles. You won four mid-am titles. I think you won in three different decades. And you won one at 50 years old, if I'm not correct. How yeah. the heck? What the heck? Yeah, that was so fun. And the, the, I, there's always a story behind it. you got to tell it. So, well, the story is, too, there's two of them. Number one, I missed playing in my first senior at one of my favorite golf courses, which was the Honors Course, yep. where I played one of my Curtis Cups. My birthday September 21st, and I was going to turn 50. Well, that tournament was the week before. Oh. And I was so disappointed when the, the calendar came out and I saw that. So then the Mid-Am came up, and, and so I end up winning 
not even getting to play in the senior. And I see that's that's I would would have loved to have played in that senior, but sure. I missed that. And I won the darn mid am, and everybody remembers that particular tournament because we had really bad rain. They left us out there too long. But that was the longest, and I'm not one for records. I don't even have. Was that like, the one in Virginia? Tri- yeah, it, it, I'll caddy yeah. for my wife. You're right. They did stay too long. <laughs> I mean, they, they, oh yeah, that's notorious. I mean, our relief was 50 yards. I started a caddy, I started a caddy union. We were going to (laughs) revolt. Well, I, I usually try to keep my cool, but I'd let them have it after that. I was one of those, uh, but the the cool thing about that, and I'm not into the records. I don't know anything about any records, but I did, uh, someone pointed this out that I may, I, it was the longest span between wins because I'd won in two that Carol Simple had the longest span between USJ wins. So that was really cool because I have so much respect for Carol, but I was one, I think in 2000 and I had two little ones and then I came back in 2011 and won again. And I had to qualify for that. I'd lost my 10 year exemption mm-hmm. into the mid am. Yeah. And I barely qualified. I had, there were two spots. There were like 10 people and I'm like, I got in, I had to qualify, I hadn't won. So it was just that I went on a little stretch there in 2011 where, you know, with a couple wins and then playing seniors and then the Curtis Cup, that was just such a special time. And so I've been looking back going, gosh, I haven't done much in a while, you know. So, but I thought, what a great four or five years I, I was blessed with. Oh, yeah. It, 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 that's so cool to be able to win at seven USGA events. I mean, if you're in the company, Joanne Carner won nine. So you're pretty close. I know you're still striving to get to that number. You mentioned. Wait a minute. She won eight. Oh, I eight. I wrote number. it. You know what? You're right. See, I knew I'm, you'd pay. I, but who's I counting? knew you'd know. Who's counting? You don't think I want that one, do you? Yeah, I think you do. You've just proved it right here on the air. We're not going to be able to edit that one out. I'll go put that in there. Okay. But, you know, you mentioned a funny story, and I read that you were trying. What was it? You missed a deadline for, uh, I think, one of the senior north-south or whatever. So you go and play in the Metro Senior Am. That's men in that's just men. And you play as and you win. The lady well, that wins. Yeah. Tell yeah, us about I, that. That's awesome. That's so cool. Well, yeah, I think I got more attention. I got a nice interview from Golf Channel. But yeah, you did. It was again it was no expectation. And it was um yeah, it was at my home course, so I kind of feel like it was cheating. Mm-mm. But it was there were two other women in it because it was open for women. It was the city metropolitan championship, so Illinois and St. Louis. And you could either declare that you're going to play in your the age group breakdowns. Okay. And I said, no, I'm going to play in the real championship. I was 60, so I could have played in the 60 to 64 age group or whatever. But I knew what I was capable of because they were playing it at the distance. I always play it with 60, 200. And, and I had been working with Steve, and I was so close to getting at the bottom of my swing and getting my game back. you know. And I actually – so I was a couple strokes behind after the first day. I think I shot 72 or 71. And then second day I go out, and I shoot 67. <laughs> you did. And I'm, I'm sitting there watching on the 18th green. Some people were coming out because there was I didn't know where I stood. And they said, Helen, if Brian, he's coming up the fairway, if he, if he, he has to par to win. If he bogeys, well, you're in a playoff. I'm like, are you kidding me? And so we're watching him play this last hole, and he gets in the left bunker. And, of course, it's my home course. And I said, that's going to be a hard bunker shot, you know. Mm-hmm. And I had a like a six-foot birdie putt on 18 that, that, looking back, could have, you know, sealed the deal. I missed it. And then he didn't get up and down, and we went to a four-hole playoff. And I ended up doing something I rarely do. I actually made a putt. I had struggled with my putt. <laughs> and it was just kind of meant to be. I just – that was that was unbelievable. And I looked back, and I said, okay, that I really – focused on every shot, my hard work for the last year of just trying to make a better swing. Because I really did kind of revamp things from those. I mean, the naked eye, most people wouldn't have noticed the difference. But for me, as you know, as a golfer, any little change isn't so little and it feels crazy. Mm-hmm. And so that was just really fun. And it wasn't, again, it, I, I'm, I've played in men's events before because there's not a lot, a lot to play in. And I've got right. to get ready. And they know I'm not about, and I think any woman that does that, isn't doing it to you know beat a man we're just no. going against ourselves sure you know it's us against the golf course and so but that was that was really a highlight of of my golfing to play at my home course and you're 60 years old name. too at the yeah, time that's so well, cool yeah to, yeah and, and the trophy has a good friend of mine's father uh, 
has the name on the trophy. So there were just some, you know, and my name's on there with all those guys. Yeah, you know? no, it's it's <laughs> awesome. I, I, I might even been working. No, I wasn't working that week, or I was I was in there, and I just remember I'm going like, what the heck. I said, she got yeah. to give me at least two shots aside now, and I get to move yeah. up to, ahead of her on the T markers, you know? Oh, I don't know. I've still got, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm a work in progress. That's still, still an like, argument we'll have for a later date. Tell us about the Curtis Cup. You, you played on two, uh, and then we'll talk about you being a captain, but you played on two Curtis. Well, and you mentioned that earlier that they mentioned to you, you could make a Curtis Cup team. Well, now you're on one. You're on two then. Tell us about those right, experiences. Right, right. And I had – it was a, such a wonderful experience. The first one I was home in Chattanooga and had wonderful um, teammates, you know, and wonderful venue. And we ended up tying that one. We had some injuries on the team. That's the one that really got away from us. That was a big, big disappointment in the sense of the outcome. Mm-hmm. But as far as just representing your country and – um playing you know around as a team with people um we're it's just amazing and jill mcgill was on that team and she just won the senior yeah. you know to still keep the friendships you know sarah lebrum ingram and i teamed up for the four ball last week and are still playing together and um so just the people the friendships that you and then the you make are just amazing you know and i was very fortunate to make that team i think i I think I hadn't won, I think, a tournament, but I'd finished high up in every major tournament, so I was fortunate enough that they gave me the nod. And uh, then I played one overseas in Killarney, and we had a bad putting putting tournament for everybody, and we lost that one, but that was a wonderful experience as well. 1994, you're named a captain. Did you have a pinch-me moment? Well, no. Well, yeah, 20, 2014. 2014. And, and yeah, I'm Saint, sorry. Yeah. Why did I put well, 94? Thing, you know, i got to start ri- typing better than this. No, that's because that's I love you because that's, that's what I do. So, he, <laughs> uh, yeah, what was neat about that was um, I don't think I was going to actually be that, you know, there's kind of an order. I was still I, the captain, but it was in St. Louis. I, it was supposed to be in Detroit, Jim, mm-hmm. and they, um, for some reason, pulled out. And the president of the USGA at the time was Tom O'Toole. Mm-hmm. And he, of course, he's been instrumental in helping. You know, St. Louis has hosted some pretty big tournaments. As yes. a matter of fact, I think you almost finished, won one yeah, here, right? Second. Yeah, in the PGA, oh, Belle Reve. Gosh, should have oh won that one. Oh, my gosh. I just, yeah. And so uh, he got it. At St. Louis agreed. It's a venue that um, is wonderful golf course. And to- they approached St. Louis Country Club, and they graciously said yes. And I think that that was what they said, you know, you know why I got the nod there. Hometown captain. And it was, I mean, I, I mean, again, a pinch, that's the pinch me moment. Right. I don't know if there's been any, I mean, I think there, I don't know when, I know Carol was in Pennsylvania, but I don't know if it was her home course, but not home co- course. There's being a captain in your home city is really cool, yes. but it's almost more, I was nervous. I felt like, oh my gosh, you know, um, there might've been a little more pressure just because it was my hometown, but it, but it wasn't really me. It's the kids, the, my team that was amazing. Yeah. Great. But players. it was special being at St. Louis country club. Yeah. And, and, and I feel I'm biased. Everybody thinks they had the greatest team, but I had a, you wonderful had a good team. one. You've had a lot of mm-hmm. LPGA players. Uh, what's the, pro- I, 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 and so I know a little bit of it. Well, how, what is the process of p- picking the team? Does the captain have much say? Take us maybe through that uh, on how the teams are chosen. Uh, yeah, maybe yeah, people I don't think, really know. Right. Well, you know, number one, um, it's evolved. It's okay. changed over time. Um, there's an international selection team committee, um, and they monitor the world rankings and everybody's finishes. And so they start the process. They're keeping their eye. They have meetings, I think. They have their list. And then when the captain's picked, you're included in some of those meetings. And so um, they, you look at the list, and I don't want to say it's all off world rankings now because used to not have a world ranking. Mm-hmm. So they look at your tournament finishes, and that, then that's not a perfect system. I don't know enough about the world rankings, but I know I think, I think they're getting ready to change how those points are given um, because um, – I don't know. I don't know if it's as reflective of who the top players are. Um, but anyway, they use the world rankings. They have committee meetings. You get on the phone. We go out and watch them. That mm-hmm. was one actually the most fun I had was going to these college tournaments. And I would actually talk to some of the coaches. You know, I'd mm-hmm. talk to the coaches. I'd watch the players. And a great story is that your wife, I was down watching something, and she, and Allie, McDonald Ewing was on the list, but mm-hmm. she wasn't like I probably as well known of a player as some of the others. 
and your wife came up and said, you better keep your eye on this girl. And so, so yeah. and I watched her and she made like seven putts in a row. And I watched, I listened to the way it sounded when she hit the ball. Mm-hmm. And I said, yeah, I, I think I'm going to, I'm going to make sure the committee keeps their eye on this girl. So you can do that kind of stuff. And right. I just love watching. And some captains wouldn't want any. They'd say, oh, just give me the team. You know, I talked to a couple of captains that were prior to me, and they didn't want to know anything. Just give me the girls. And right. I was more like, and I think because I was a coach, and I had a little more interest in just the hands-on, watching their actual swing, how they're hitting actual shots, just because I love that. Um, so, and then, they, and then they do the tough decision. There's a lot of good players that, that could play on that team, but we got to stop at eight. So, so when you're watching them, how it's it's always tricky. And they talk about Ryder Cup, Presidents Cup, putting teams together. Uh, and you don't have to give me all the secrets because I know you have one. Uh, but watching them, that probably had to help you when you put the players together in team formats, or maybe because you're not around them all the time. I think that's the difficult part about the Curtis Cup and the Walker Cup, uh, where Ryder Cup, Presidents Cup, they kind of see how people interact. It's tough to put those together. How did you do that? How did you match them up? Well, I kind of – I had a 15th club in my bag. And you know Don Woodard, yep. who oh, actually yeah. played with your wife. Yep. And I had um, I had, had the good fortune of talking to Marilyn and Jim Hardy. And they um, had oh, – what was it? Uh, an Azinger, you know, how he did mm-hmm. his pods. Yep. And I had read that book. And, and being the, like, perfectionist anal person that I am, I was really intrigued by that. And I had Don come in and do some team building for me. And she kind of told me a little bit about the players. And the players actually loved it because she right. did kind of that uh, an assessment kind of thing on with them. Not so much, And not only just for me, but just for them. They actually thought it was so fun to know how they're wired and how their teammates are wired. And we actually, once she kind of gave us a little idea of how each person, what makes each person tick, I got them a head cover that – simulated how they were wired and gave it to them at one of our team meetings. Like I still have mine. I'm so like, I'm so hyper-focused. I was like a B cause I'm buzzing all over the place. I'm nonstop. <laughs> I never slow down, you know? And, um, and I can't remember what we, what everybody was. So don't ask me that question. No, I'm not gonna do but that. that was kind of part cool. of our team bonding and kind of got a little bit of guidance and insight, and I was a big advocate of that. Mm-hmm. And and I might be – I think I'm the only person that probably did that as much, used that source. Um, but the players are so good, to be honest with you, these yeah. players. That, but, but what it taught me was just because two people want to play together Mm-mm. doesn't mean they might – be good as good together That's true. you know like two good friends playing and you know that yep. just in how you play and people who play with me they have to be special because i am like crazy they have my poor partners i always feel sorry for them but uh so you got to kind of know that and that and there was an instance when two people wanted to play and they didn't match up very good you know based on some of the stuff and so we that was probably the only thing i did you know no that was um, brilliant because i think you yeah. see you're seeing college coaches do a little the problem is with recruiting kids you can't really make them take the personality i think it's so good for the player because don helped kathleen a lot when she was at lsu and realizing kathleen's personality that we really i don't know if we misunderstood her but it really helped us understand like oh she doesn't like conflict that why that's why she comes across a little more not standoffish but that's her personality where my oldest was like she'll beat you at any cost she's nice about it but uh they're all so different and i think that's yeah. you see college coaches and they don't have that ability to kind of look at kids when they're recruiting but watching them and i ask college coaches what are you looking for how they treat their parents how they act after when things aren't going so well uh, what kid might want the ball when it's time to, to make the big putt or, or, or hit the big shot? So I think they look at those things. And for you kids listening, coaches are watching. Uh, you got to pay attention to that. And, and, and like you said, that was a brilliant way y'all won. Uh, and Allie's been on two Solheim Cups, so it was a pretty good choice on your part too, by the way. Uh, oh, I, <laughs> I give your wife all the credit. <laughs> exactly. But you were St. Louis Sports Hall of Fame, the you know Missouri Sports Hall of Fame, like I said, seven USGA titles, all these great awards. Is there something that stands out that you're most proud of, or what would you say, uh, and you're far from being finished, but what are you so most proud of uh, when you look over the time of you playing? Well, um, I think that I'm 
most proud of that I juggled it all, meaning I was able to have an amazing husband, get married to an amazing man. I had two amazing children. I had a career as a teacher and coach, and I had success at the greatest game ever played. And it's hard that not a lot of people can always say that. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fish in a little pond in amateur golf, but to be able to do it all, I feel like I've had it all, Jim. You know, I've been so blessed, and um, I just thank God for that every day. That's a great way to answer. Appreciate you being with us, and uh, uh, good luck the rest of the season. I know you're going to play some golf. You're going to be out there hitting golf balls for the days out, but we appreciate you being with us. Okay, I'm going to go play a par five and apply the Jim Gallagher layup method. <laughs> go for it in two. Don't lay it up. <laughs> Okay, buddy. Thank you. Thank you.